The ancient Umbrians, called Ombricoi by Erodotto and defined by Plinius the Elder as Gens Antiquissima Italiae, beginning at the end of the second millennia before Christ, in the Bronze Age, they had settled where, in the present day, is commonly known as Middle Italy, an area much larger than the actual small Umbria, which extended from the Po to the Tiber. In fact, ancient sources speak of an Umbrian influence, more precisely Sarsinate, as commented in the 4th century AD by Ene di Servio. A few centuries later was the birth of the Iron Age, migrating peoples, most probably coming from the East or perhaps Central Europe, had settled along the Tyrrhenian coast where they founded commercial colonies which had blossomed along the way. Then they penetrated inward the peninsula through the natural roads among the Apennine crossings. They then moved inland through the natural crossings of the Apennines and occupied part of the territories that were, until that time, inhabited by the Paleoumbri, known by Roman historians as Aborigines, in order to indicate the population that was present there since the beginning of time. More than just a simple migration, it was a complex process of culturalization where Eastern influences, also explainable through ancient commercial contacts, gave way to a new cultural facies as a result of the transformation undergone by the cultures of the local populations. This primordial mixture of different cultures gave way to a new civilization, that of the Etruscans. Around the 2nd century BC, the Tiber made a natural border between two populations, the Umbrians and the Etruscans. And Perugia, on the right banks of the river, then became one of the most important Etruscan cities associated with other centers in the ties with the Dodecapoli. One of the best-known texts from the Umbrian language is found in Gubbio, the Eugebine tablets. From the seven bronze tablets, the first five, from an older period, are carved with Umbro-Etruscan characters, whereas a part of the back from the fifth, as well as two others from a later date, utilize Latin characters, different alphabets for the ancient Umbrian language. These tablets describe religious rituals of those people, which re-emerge from the century's darkness with the indelible strength of its markings. The duties of translating them had required the best Italian language specialists, and thanks to them, the tablets' contents have been decoded, which have brought us the knowledge of ancient religious rituals characteristic of the Umbrian population. Although the tablets date back to the 3rd and 1st century BC, their writings seem to be even more archaic. In the seven tablets, from which the organization of sacerdotal power is illustrated, as well as numerous divinities characterized by the Umbrian polytheism, such as the Grabovia Triumvirate composed of Jupiter, Mars, and Vophione, and are complex descriptions of religious ceremonies, rituals of a lustral and propitious nature based on animal sacrifice and observations on the flight of birds. From the Eugebine tablets and the testimonies of other rare Umbrian texts, we understand that Umbrian religion was polytheistic, like those of other Italic populations, as well as the Roman, and was widespread throughout the entire Umbrian territory. For example, there are 25 divinities, or gods, cited in the Eugebine text, known as the Cupras Matris Plestinas, known as Cupra, mother of the Umbrian Plestines, cited in the Plestilaminas, the actual Col Fiorito. The Umbrian territory preserves ceramic, weaponry, and religious bronze works, which help us to recognize the characteristics of this Italic population through their artistic and artisan production. Legend has it that Perugia was founded by the hero Auleste, brother or son of Ocno, founder of Chiusi, Bologna, and Mantua. 
It's possible that Ocno and Auleste had an important role in both the Etruscan colonization of the Valle Padana, as well as the Umbro Tuscan territory. If this were confirmed, the two sculptures on the Porta Marzia above the archway together with Jupiter and the Etruscan Tinia, flanked by their steeds, could truly represent the two founding brothers of Etruscan cities and not, as tradition maintains, the Dioscuri. The name Auleste transforms into Euliste in the Middle Ages. We know that the myth of Perugia's founder was particularly popular and alive in the 13th century, so much so as the free municipality wanted to insert the Etruscan Euliste among the base reliefs of the Median Bath in the Fontana Maggiore. Some material findings from the Iron Age, such as a sword from Fontivegge and Villanovian fragments found in the Verzaro area along the Piaggia Colombada and Monte Luce, give testimony to the existence of a settlement of huts and a nearby burial site from the 8th century BC. Traces of settlements in the Perugia territory are found from the middle of the 6th century BC at Castel San Mariano on the road to Chiusi, as well as San Valentino di Marciano on the road to Orvieto. These traces, composed of funeral decorations, reflect archaic ideological models significantly similar to those of the nearby Italic world, such as the well-known chariot of Monteleone di Spoleto. The necropolises used in the ancient age confirm the beginning of urban development and illustrate the space which later will be circumscribed by the walled belt. Two documents from the end of the 6th century BC indicate the principal cultural references in the city's formative process, the Sparandio sarcophagus and the older written artifact found in the city, the alphabet table scratched into the bottom of a bucaro cup. Both reveal that early Perugia was mostly a tributary of Cusi and Orviedo. The sarcophagus, by the presence of weaponry in the funeral arrangements, was that of a warrior, actually attributed to an atelier from Cusi and made from fetid stone, typical of that area. Whereas the alphabet table, judging from the ductus and orthography, comes from Orviedo. In recent years, there have been diverse interpretations of the scene represented on the sarcophagus front. A migration from Cusi to Perugia, or else the return from a fortunate raid, or the departure of a chief with his followers towards the Padana Plains, or perhaps the depiction of a Perugian victory over the Umbrian groups. The Etruscan city walls expand for slightly less than three kilometers, following the winding orographic land patterns. As such, it has the shape of a clover with the major gates corresponding with the protuberances and the stem used for pedestrians corresponding to the entrances. The walled courtyard formed by large blocks of travertine lime kiln is still visible for many tracks along the modern day Via Battisti. or the ample concavity of the cupa, or the areas near the Arco della Mandorla and the Arco dei Gigli. The construction of the walls can be dated from the third century BC and denotes an urban aspect and an internal and external viability already used in other roadways Among the points of interest is the imposing Sorbello well, 35 meters deep, characterized by the presence from the coupling to the quadrangular mouth and the cylindrical pole, two large lithic traves built with travertine blocks, which were used to support the cover made of large slabs.
It is the work of great engineering and difficult to date, even though the constructive characters on the walls and large squared blocks help to date the feet around the 3rd century BC. On the basis of the findings, it is possible to also notice the principal sacred areas of the Etruscan city, particularly one found near a beautiful wall which proceeds towards the north. In the present-day Piazza Quattro Novembre, a great plateau. Here one or more temples jutted forth, dedicated to the divinity of the Etruscan pantheon, divine and powerful beings that dominated the world with magical and mysterious powers. Other sanctuaries dedicated to the Etruscan gods were dislocated inside the urban perimeters or in external areas. Testifying to their presence, some statuettes in bronze were found, such as those from the clan of San Faustino, as well as elements in terracotta, such as acretes, fixtures, and shingles. The two gates inside the walls to the north, the Arco Etrusco, or Arco di Augusto, and facing south, towards the Tiber and Rome, the Porta Marzia are those of monumental grandeur, as they affirm the city's superiority and power. The Porta Marzia has undergone a transition by Antonio da San Gallo during the time of the Rocca Paolina construction in 1540, for which the jams still in place are now found inside the same fortress. On the archway, at the sides, are two names, the inscription Augusta Perusia, from the end of the first century BC, whereas higher above is a simulated tunnel illustrated by four pillars with Corinthian capitals which frame five spaces where the guardian protectors of the city are facaded. There is another inscription on the frame above, Colonia Vibia, a remembrance of the Ius Colonei, conceded in the 3rd century AD by the emperor of Perugine origin, Gaio Vibio Treboniano Gallo. The Etruscan Ark to the north appears like a fortified gate built between two robust bastions which jut forth like two towers. It has an archway formed by rows of radial basins and a cornice that frames a passage facing an oblique tract with regards to the walls. Here as well, on the arches basins, the inscription Augusta Perusia, where the recent restorations found traces of the color red. Above the arch, among the two rows of jutting basins, upon the lower one, the words Colonia Vibia, runs a Doric marking, where alternating shields of grooved pillars with Ionic capitals, which act as a base for a second arch, today chipped, behind which a patrol guard had stood watch. Along the sides of the hill where the city lays are numerous burial grounds, which have restituted material dating back to the 6th century BC. The oldest and most frequented are the two areas where the necropolis of Palazzoni is found, near the bridge or Ponte San Giovanni. This necropolis, by its location, as well as its more ancient Hellenistic phase, was a smaller inhabited one, distinct from the city, already documented in a prehistoric age. It must have been an opidum of Perugia, controlled by the Tiber Ford. The necropolis is made up of a series of Hippogean tombs dug from the rock in the hill, more or less refined by various planimeters, most dating from the Hellenistic period, each one preserved inside by urns decorated with the ashes of the deceased, belonging to an entire family and gathered in a linen cloth.
The most noteworthy tomb is that of Volumni, entirely dug from the rock and accessible from a long dromos with a steep stairway. The interior, closed at the time by an imposing door, reproduces the cavern-like habitations of the time, including the architectural decorations that depict gargoyles, male heads, snake-like figures, and female faces. The atrium has a double-slope ceiling. The sides open into four burial chambers. At the end of a side corridor are three rooms. The central one, the tablino, is the largest. There is an Etruscan inscription on the entrance door which depicts the tomb's construction as the work of the brothers Arnth and Larth Velimna. The head of the family is buried here, Arnth Velimna. depicted in the typical banquet position, whereas below is the depiction of the afterlife gate guarded by two winged ancestors. It is highly elaborate work and testifies to the level reached by the Perugine artisans in the third century BC, and together with the same family urns, demonstrate the importance and the wealth of this family through their agricultural domains that allowed the exporting of vast grain supplies to Rome. The last descendant, Voluminius Violens, deposited in a marble urn as an onomastic bilingual formula, both in Latin and Etruscan. The tomb, built like a small version of his own house, expresses every necessity of its owner, as the afterlife had to be a model of life in the present. The tomb's aristocratic aspect reaffirms the values of the status and justifies the findings of the objects that would be used in the afterlife imagined as that of the earthbound one. So the burial place was not a simple grave, but a room filled with funeral beds, carriages, vases, weapons, jewelry. Besides the head of the family, there were also the burial places of descendants and quite often also the servants. The voluminous gathering of the urns from the Palazzonian necropolises readily testify to the technique adopted by sculptures, who make ample use of polychrome, as well as the wealth of the mythological repertory depicted. The sacrifice of Iphigenia, the death of Troilo, the battle of Eteocle and Polynice, the assault on Tebe, Oreste persecuted by the Erinis, the battle between the Greeks and Persians, Caledonio hunting wild boar, the struggle between Griffi and Arimaspoi, the Centaurimachie, the Gigantomachie, Scylla battling Odisseo, the recognition of Paride and Marcia bound. Poor in architectural refurnishing, but of great importance because it remained untouched at the moment of its finding, is the tomb of the Kutu. By chance re-emerged 30 years ago during agricultural work on the so-called Topo di Monteluce. Along the end wall is the burial place of the family head in an arenaria sarcophagus with urns of nearly 50 male descendants surrounding it, all decorated with paintings and polychrome stuccos. There is one of a young man with golden hair and almond eyes. Some decorative objects, a cotabos, and parts of a bronze armature probably belonging to the head of the family were found among the small urns.
The burial place dates between the beginning of the 3rd and the 1st century BC and allows us to know the social status of the Kutu, a family originally of servant class from the 3rd and 2nd century BC, to a higher social status, perhaps in virtue of the economic development following the Hannibal Wars, which allowed them to forget their servile origins, eliminating the Kai from the family name and Latinizing it with the noble moniker Cutius. The family's last depositions coincide with the events of the Perugia War between Lucio Antonio and Ottaviano in the first century BC. The remains of the Sperandio necropolis were found more to the north of the city by the Porta Pulcra. From here come precious objects, such as the Aureo Diadema, now preserved in Florence, as well as the noteworthy sarcophagus in the Archaeological Museum of Perugia. The simple burial room, now visible and preceded by an entrance corridor at the end of which leads to the closing door of the Hippogea. Isolated burials were found to the west of the city. Among these, one of great interest is the Hippogea of San Manno, dated from the 3rd century BC. It is a rectangular room of domed structure as was the custom in the Perugia area, as well as Betona in Torgiano and in the Fagetto tomb, with two half-quadrangular cells with long sides. The constructive perfection is noted with large blocks of travertine, well squared, that are put dryly into place following perfectly regular rows. The tomb was used as a cellar for the above medieval complex, which had modified the entrance, now on the opposite side with regards to the original one. On one of the walls is a funeral inscription almost five meters long, which runs along three lines and preserves the Preku family memory of whom this Hippogea belongs. In Betona, a city on the outskirts tied to Perugia, is the prevailing Etruscan element situated to the left of the Tiber. In the 3rd century BC, the city was walled behind an imposing belt structure and at the end of the century was given an hippogea with domed facades, similar to the one in San Manno. At the foot of Mount Tezio, to the north of the city towards Umbertide, is the Fageto tomb, where one enters through a narrow corridor where a door is integrally preserved with the hinges still functioning. This too is characterized by domed facades formed by radially disposed basins. At the moment of the find in 1920, a simple travertine urn with the name of the deceased, Arnth Kairnina, was found on a bench which runs along the inside of the burial site. Other decorative materials were also found dating from the 2nd century BC. The Etruscan people had highly developed religious concepts relative to the nether world. The mystery of the passage from life to death was often depicted in Etruscan art, where an infernal demon figure appears, Karun, jealous keeper of the netherworld and transporter of souls. On many of the Perugia area urns, we find a monstrous animal whose aspect preludes the medieval depiction of the Perugia griffin. The materials found inside the diverse Perugine necropolises allow us to recognize certain products made by artisan workshops, many of which were active in other Etruria centers or imported from Greece. Like many ancient ceramics, such as the amphora with black figures from San Valentino di Marciano with Tesio and the Minotaur. 
or the red figured Kilix with Kotobo's players by the painter Antiphon, or the great ancient red figured vase with bronze cover depicting the myth of Tritolemo coming from the Frontone necropolis. Other noteworthy Etruscan bronzes come from the Archaic Age in burial places throughout the Perugia area. The Leib tripods found in San Valentino della Colina and now in the Archaeological Museum in Munich. And the carriage bronzes from San Mariano. They are principally decorations from three carriages, which certainly belong to one of the noble families who controlled the territory between Perugia and Chiusi. These show the power enjoyed by the new Principes, power they maintained until the latter half of the 6th century BC. The dig contained, other than many elements relating to banqueting and weaponry, numerous statuettes and applique in molten bronze, other than the laminated bronze covering, the wheel rims and harnesses for the three carriages, as the remains made their reconstruction possible. One of the carriages found in the tomb was a carpentum, or rather the carriage where the bride rode upon, or the newlyweds, dating back to 560 BC. The laminated bronzes depicting the adventures of the young Peleo, Achilles' father, and his marriage to Teti, symbolically refer to the feminine world and the role of women who enjoyed particular consideration in the Etruscan world. Another is the Kurus, or the chariot, which the prince used for his travels and which accompanied him in the afterlife, anticipating the apotheosis. The mythological depiction represented on the bronze covering symbolized the prince's self-identification with the heroes represented and seemed to tell the story of the deceased's voyage and his nearing to the gods. Still from Perugia comes the extraordinary bronze urn from the 4th century BC, with the portrait of a young man half lying in the classic position of the banqueter on the cover. Found in the 1800s and is preserved today at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Minor bronze productions are also counted among the objects of everyday use, such as mirrors decorated with refined incisions, belonging to decorations from female tombs, such as the one from the Santa Caterina Vecchia Necropolis, which depicts Helena, Laomedonte, and the Dioscuri. Whereas from the male tombs come helmets, shields, armature, and other objects used in battle and athletic activities. Other findings from female tombs are jewelry, such as the beautiful gold earrings, they too from the Santa Caterina Necropolis near Perugia, as well as those from the Bittona tomb. The stone urns are made with a local stone from the caves of Santa Sabina near Corciano, travertine lime kiln that was refined in stucco and painted with vibrant colors. The use of incineration was widespread, with the funeral custom placing the deceased's ashes inside the urn, sculptured in stone. In Volterra, they used alabaster. In Cusi, they used terracotta. Determined from the 4th century BC forward, for the entire Hellenistic period, a blossoming artisanal production. The deceased man or woman or couple were depicted on the urn's cover, whereas the receptacle had mythological scenes sculpted upon them. 
Greek myths and Etruscan themes coexisted together, commonly adopted by the same figurative language, in one of the more characteristic examples of the Etruscan art in Perugia. A group of materials, the Perugian area of Elche, were recently found and are now exhibited in the archaeological museum. They are a cover from a sarcophagus and 22 urns coming from the tomb of the Cockney family. In the Hellenistic period, all particularly refined, embellished with traces of gold and colored pigments, which signal the activity of highly refined artistic workshops in Perugia. Also those coming from the nearby city of Cusi. Together with these decorative objects, the digs also made the reconstruction of the cultural, social, and ideological evolution possible. On one side, Perugia's dominating class between the end of the 4th and 1st century offers a section of social history of the aristocratic elites in the first phase of Romanization, with its forms of self-representation in a tomb reserved primarily for the family's male lineage. In one of the urns belonging to Arth Cacno, there is a depiction of Enomao and Pelope, known in Greek literature thanks to the description by Pausania. Recent archaeological investigations near Strozza Caponi brought to light 34 tombs and rooms as well as 11 graves from a necropolis already investigated in the 1800s and must have contained more than 100 tombs. One of the most important of these is that of Ane Markna, called Tomb of the Funeral Bed. Dug from the travertine deposit, preceded by a long dromos, and found intact, the tomb held eight urns on the benches, decorated with sculpted reliefs of vibrant colors and inscriptions that refer to the Ane Markna family. Departure scenes, the battle between centaurs and lapites, Sheila, the legend of the Sete against Tebe. Feminine figures follow along the eight urns front. But the most surprising find is the two groups of bronze elements that help to indicate the presence of five funeral beds and the reconstruction of two of these, characterized by two beautiful fulcra in the shape of a bird's head and the head of a mule. The noted inscription Cippo di Perugia is one of the longest inscriptions in the Etruscan language. It runs for a good 46 lines on the face of a stone stem found in 1822 on the hill of San Marco in nearby Perugia. The stem was lodged in the ground and stuck out for almost one and a half meters. The text speaks of a pact between the Vetina and Afuna families regarding the shared use of some property that contained a water source in a tomb of the Veltina. We can say that it deals with the monumentalization of a pact that was to be passed down through the generations as a binding legal document. Rome had revealed its expansionist intentions to the southern Etrurian cities since the beginning of the 4th century BC. Already conqueror of the Campania and Apulia regions in 311 BC, Rome had triumphantly led its army into Perugia, who had subsequently asked for a 30-year truce. The battles, however, began once more, and in 295 BC, according to Livio, 4,500 Perugines had died in battle, and the city had to pay a very high tax to the Roman Republic. Music 
That same year, during the Sanite Wars, spelled the end of the Etruscans and their allies, the Umbrians, Sanites, and Gauls near Sentino in the Fabrianese territory. In the battle against the Romans and their allies, the Picenes, and thus marked the Roman dominion over all of central Italy. All in all, the land estates of the aristocracy had remained intact, and for this reason, Perugia was not subjected to great economic upheaval. Rather, the necropolises show the development in this period of intense agricultural use of the territory, which extended to include the numerous pagi that surrounded the city. Perugia was allied to Rome in the Hannibal Wars, providing supplies, wood, and grain along the Tiber's waterway. In 130 BC, Perperna, of probable Perugine origin, was elected Roman consulate, and the city quickly saw another two Perugia families, the Vibi and the Vocacci families, enter into the Senate. Thus, the Etruscans and the Umbrians found themselves inserted into the corpus of the Cives Romani. Assigned to different municipalities and tribes, Perugia became a municipium held by a quattur or viro and was assigned to the Tromentina tribe. A radical change was also determinate in the widespreading use of the Latin language, both in public and private. From nearby Perugia, perhaps from Pila or Sanguinedo, an area near Tuoro, comes the most famous bronze sculpture in the Etruscan world, a wax fusion lost into seven pieces, known as the Herangular, the Etruscan Aulo Metello, a realistic portrait from the end of the second and the start of the first century BC. His arm is raised forward, asking for silence from the crowd. This symbolically marks the end of the Etruscan civilization as it slowly is absorbed by the Roman one. One of the last publicly known Etruscan inscriptions is that found on the statue's toga, where it states that the statue was dedicated to Aulo Metello by a magistrate, perhaps a burial monument or sanctuary outside the city. Characterized by the worship of many gods, the Roman religion was influenced by many Italic peoples, Umbrians, Sabines, Sanites, Latins, and Etruscans. Also after the conquest of Greece by the Greek religion and was open to the religions of other populations and had often assimilated their gods, beliefs, and rituals. The Pax Romana actually consisted of this respecting the religious, political, and social traditions of the conquered people and integrating them with the Roman laws and jurisdictions. Religion's primary function in Rome was social and political, and with this all subjects were called to recognize and honor the divine power, the basis of the empire. The emperor himself expected to be adored as a god, assuming the title of Pontifex Maximus. With the murder of Caesar and the victory over the assassins, the birth of the Second Triumvirate and the election of Lucio Antonio to council in 41 BC, a heavy political contrast had developed and the strategic choice to go to war with Perugia was made. Described by Aliano as a strong, secure, fortified city. Proof of the Bellum Perusinum are numerous projectiles hurled by the soldiers with slingshots, with inscriptions and incitements, some obscene, towards their commanders. The end of the assault witnessed Octavian's victory, and a fire destroyed the city with the exception of the Temple of Vulcano and a statue of Junone, which was brought to Rome. The city was then restituta, that is, completely reorganized, and called Augusta in honor of Octavian, who had become emperor. Proof is seen some remains found near Porta Sant'Angelo.
the Roman presence is consolidated over the entire Umbrio territory, where still today we find Roman-made public works, such as roads, bridges, theaters, and temples, such as the Domus, with frescoed walls, mosaics, and rare marble coverings. Extraordinary works of historic, artistic, and urbanist value that demonstrate the elevated social, cultural, and technical levels of the Romans. An economic upswing seemed to have taken place at the end of the Augustan period and for the entire first century BC, owing to the personal and career successes of people tied to the city's aristocracy. In the third century AD, a citizen of Perugia, Gaio Vibio Treboniano Gallo, was elected emperor, and thanks to him, the city became a colony, as we read on the principal gates to the city. The Roman city's forum area, known today as Piazza Quattro Novembre, was terraced with a splendid squared wall, as one can see in Via delle Cantine. At the foot of the Acropolis' terrace, in Piazza Cavallotti, the digs have brought to light two tracks of ancient road, whereas near Piazza Morlacchi, the remains of a building structure with a multicolored geometric mosaic from the late ancient period, the 5th to the 4th century AD, have been uncovered. Architectural terracotta, found from the digs under the Duomo, prove the existence of temples in two chronological phases between the 4th and the 2nd to 1st centuries BC. They primarily referred to a temple which, at the time, held the monumental podium which today faces Piazza Quattro Novembre. Also uncovered were marble cornices dating back to the Roman era and still visible are the remains of a Domus Romana with frescoed walls. The remains of a Roman amphitheater from the first century AD are found on the outskirts of the city. The reconstructed ellipse spans 80 by 60 meters. A large tract of the wall's cemented perimeter can be seen inside the Palazzo della Penna. It is three meters high and is the entrance to the cave. The presence of Roman thermal baths can be found in the Conca area, with black and white mosaics depicting Orpheus from the beginning of the second century AD. Here, the mythical singer is caught in the act of soothing a brood of 40 animals with the sound of his lyre. The nearby structures document the transformation from this complex to a Christian building. Just outside the city, near the church of San Bevignate, restoration works on the church brought to light a large tract of terracotta pavement and a tract of mosaic pavement belonging to a residential villa just below that. Also found were a system of different types of basins, two of which are connected and present a brick surface laid in fishbone style. The discovery of canals and other elements allow us to think that the area was used as a fulonica, the typical laundromat of the Roman era. Perugia dominating the Tiber Valley and the road that tied the two Roman capitals, Rome and Ravenna, in the 6th century, in the Greek Gothic War, 535 to 553, was attacked by the Goths. Its walls strongly defended by Bishop Ercolano, true defensor civitatis, 
and represented the common interests of Rome and the Christians against the Barbers. Forty days after his beheading, which took place between 548 and 549, Ercolano's body was buried under these walls. After a time, it was moved to a funeral basilica known as San Pietro, or St. Peter's, which rose up from a plain non longe a Civitate, Monte Calvario, outside of Porta Marzia. Sixteen Roman columns, proof of the early date of their construction, 4th to the 5th century, must have been part of a series of cemetery buildings, including a mausoleum. There must have been two burial places in the center and others in the niches and the corridor, a building unto itself and then a basilica crypt with modifications from the 10th century when Ercolano's remains were transferred to the Cathedral of San Lorenzo and the Church of San Pietro became a Benedictine abbey. The road that leads to Rome is traditionally occupied by cemetery areas since the time of the Etruscans. Then later the Romans, who erected a building dedicated to San Costanzo, probable bishop of Perugia, martyred in the time of Emperor Antonino, Marcus Aurelius, and buried, according to the Passio Constanzi, non longe ab urbin loco qui dicitur areola. Inside the church are certain marbles that were once part of an altar, perhaps that which is found in the Christian mausoleum at San Pietro decorated with elegant vines originating from an acanthus tree and inhabited by flocks of small birds, a motif from the Augustine age, probably sculpted in the first century AD and used again in the Paleo-Christian era. The burial of the saints and the beatified inside sarcophaguses dates back to ancient Roman times, and the use of sarcophaguses as altars in Christian churches have two marvelous examples in Perugia, in the church of Sant'Ercolano and the oratory of San Bernardino. The first is the sarcophagus from the 2nd to 1st century BC, moved to Sant'Ercolano after its discovery in 1616 at Sant'Orfeo, a town situated along Perugia's northern route. For its large dimensions and the quality of marble used, it must have belonged to a person of great status. Probably made in Roman workshops, this depicts two large lion figures. The second, a marble Roman sarcophagus, depicts the Missio Apostolorum, discovered in the Campo dell'Orto, near the Franciscan settlement at Prato. It was used in 1262 to carry the beatified body of Egidio, one of St. Francis's first companions. It is the most beautiful piece preserved in Umbria, which testifies to the early century Christian art with Christ at the center, a woman to his left, representing the church, and on his right, the portraits of philosophers and depictions of the apostles. It comes from the 4th century AD and was made in an important Roman workshop, perhaps the same that made the noted sarcophagus of Giunio Basso. To the north of the city, upon leaving the Arco di Augusto and following the road towards Ravenna, in an area that was probably occupied by the Byzantine militia of Perugia, the Church of San Michele Arcangelo, or Saint Michael the Archangel, was built in the 6th century. Despite the mutilations and the modifications made over the centuries, it is one of the most significant Paleo-Christian monuments in Umbria. 
also for its clear Byzantine Ravenna influences, for its late Roman building technique, and for its consistent use of materials traced from structures in the classical era. Its iconography depicts a small-scale replica of a well-known building, the Ravenna Church of San Vitale, a Palatine church reserved for the religious ceremonies of the court. The original building presented a cross-like plan indicated by the presence of four small basins placed in correspondence to the four cardinal points which opened by means of four triforays on the perimeter walls of the main nave. The central circular basin, not perfectly concentric with regards to the perimeter wall, supported the cover, perhaps a dome originally, now a roof supported by large Gothic arches. What greatly characterizes the inside is the presence of 16 columns subdivided into two groups of eight with Corinthian capitals, some of which have Greek letters engraved on them, the most recurring being Eta, Rho, and Omega. Like the apse of the church, these are made of granite and much larger in dimension. The others, made of gray marble on a high pedestal, create a rhythmic, proportional, and chromatic rapport. Perugia, Byzantine after 537 AD, caught between the late ancient and the medieval, witnessed the transformation of form and space of the Roman cities in function of the presence of new hegemonic classes and new institutions. The complex historic events and the testimony of art, although rarefied in the medieval centuries, continue to flow in time contributing to the development of a city's artistic patrimony that can boast, through the course of time, a great cultural and historic wealth, as well as extraordinarily vast and varied memories and events.